Chapter Fourteen of the Story of a New Zealand River by Jane Mander. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Fourteen. You got my message," said Bob Hargraves, raising his face from his desk as Bruce walked into the store. Sensing something wrong, he looked down quickly. "Why, no, Bob. What is it?" "I sent Dick after you. He must have missed you." He lowered his eyes uneasily. "The boss has been whiskying himself blind at Point Curtis all day." "What?" Bruce fell back a pace, as if he had suddenly run into a wall. He stared back at Bob, who had made an effort to look up without recognition of the fact that Bruce himself had been back only a week since his own break. Every man about the place knew that Bruce's lapses were not a subject for comment or for joke. No one had ever hinted to him of any knowledge of them. "'Afraid it's true,' said Bob, trying to speak lightly. "'What struck him?' exclaimed Bruce, looking for a reason. It was a well-known fact that Roland was almost a teetotaler. "'Anything happen? I was in the bush last night. Yes, some of the new machinery has been wrecked on the Three Kings.' He got a telegram about it last night. He scared me. I thought he would go crazy. Bob saw that Bruce's thoughts had turned from the cause of the boss's outburst to the probable effect of it upon his family. I tried to calm him down before he went home, he went on, but by the look of him this morning he had not had a restful night. He rode off about ten, I suppose, to the bush, or I would have got word up to you. I knew nothing till Harold Brayton came along about four and said he was down there and pretty mad. He had tried to get him away, but couldn't. He thought you had better get down there as soon as you could. With a groan, Bruce walked a step or two to the door, where he stood looking out unseeing upon the river. The knock-off horn had just sounded at the kitchen, and along the tramway in the spit, and on the booms, the men were gathering up their tools and tidying up things for the night. Bruce was vaguely conscious of their movements, as he tried to think how this last disaster was to be faced. This blow had fallen out of a clear sky, and there was more to think about than its effect upon Alice, though that had been his first concern. Bruce knew even better than she did how deeply the boss was involved, and what risks he had taken, and how many men would suffer if he broke down. He knew also how greatly he had been trusted, because he was believed to be absolutely reliable. One of the first things to be done was to see if it could not be kept quiet. Then, realizing the need for prompt action in various directions he swung round do they know at the house bob i don't know but brayton would hardly tell them we must keep it from them get round the men this evening bob and tell them to keep it dark i'll go up to the house before i go after him and i'll think out something when i see what he's like and hang around in case mrs roland wants you and remember you don't know anything without waiting for bob to reply he swung out and up the path Mingled with his anxiety for Roland and his concern for Alice was a numbing sense of humiliation. He wondered if the boss had flown to whiskey because his own recent breakdown had pointed the way. He felt that if Alice got to know she would think so, and it made him feel like an accessory to the deed. It was impossible to think of Roland's orgy without thinking of his own. He dreaded now above all things that Alice should learn of it. Bruce had seen Alice twice in the past week but only for a few minutes at a time. Though Roland had always covered up his tracks by saying he was away on business somewhere, he was sure she knew, and he had been particularly sensitive this last time, because he had a horrible conviction that he had failed her by going away as he had, after their revelation of feeling, and he felt she thought so too, and that she did not in the least understand the nature of his problem. It made him sick to think that she grieved over him in secret, or that she condemned his weakness. It was the only thing about which he could not be humorous, and he knew, as he went up the slope, that her attitude of mind would be much more uncompromising toward her husband, not only because she both feared and loathed drunkenness, but because she would resent it fiercely as something she had not bargained for in her relations with him. As he approached the front gate, the door opened, and he knew she had been watching for him. Before he reached her, he saw what the night had done to her, that she had had no sleep and that her eyes burned with fear. In her relief at seeing him, she forgot all about his recent absence, or the cause of it. Oh, David, where is Tom? He took the hands she held out to him. God, he groaned, was it as bad as that? She moved her head, unable to speak. He closed the door behind him. 
he could hear asia giving the children their tea in the kitchen alice motioned him into the bedroom so that they could talk without being heard where is he she asked again he saw from the mixed expression in her eyes that she sensed something and he wondered what it was but he lied quickly in the bush i've drugged him we will look after him up there he thought he detected a flicker of suspicion in her eyes but it was instantly swamped out by relief she sank into her chair pressing her closed hands into her eyeballs in a dazed sort of way i couldn't have stood another night she said wildly for a moment he wanted to tell her that she didn't have to stand that he wanted to tell her many things he had looked for opportunity to say but he knew she could hear nothing then so he merely took her hands and gripped them then he remembered roland there is something i have to do he said but i expect to be back by nine o'clock now lie down and stop thinking send for bob if you want anything i will stay with you to-night there is nothing more to worry about leave the future alone he knew that his short sentences shot at her had a curious hypnotic effect upon her but he was anxious about her as he looked down at her he was afraid she could not stand more without breaking down herself and all this was a very bad beginning for another child but he had no time to stay longer and with another grip of her hands he left her when he got to point curtis he found roland raging like a wild beast he had laid out two men and it had taken four of them to get him tied down he tried to spring at bruce thinking he was a log about to fall upon him the public house was full of men who had taken a hand at trying to calm him curiously enough nobody seemed to regard it as a joke when bruce heard how much whiskey roland was said to have consumed he treated the proprietor to much language unbecoming to an english gentleman and scared him with the prospect of losing his license and a period in jail after drugging the boss and leaving careful instructions to cover any emergency he rode back to the bay and sent down shiny and another man to help with the nursing and to bring him up in the morning if he was well enough then he went round the cottages reassuring the men and asking them to keep the story in the place he found alice lying on the front room sofa with asia bathing her head she asked him no questions and made no attempt to talk he was a bit perplexed by her indifference to her husband's state for he knew she must guess that he was really ill it showed he thought how bad was her reaction from her own fear and suffering from asia after her mother was asleep he heard the story of the night before when roland had paced the floor hour after hour muttering and delirious declaring at intervals that he was done and that he would kill himself he gathered that alice had been unable to do anything with him but that she had probably made him worse by suggesting things that inflamed him to irritable rage it was dreadful uncle david asia shuddered at the memory of it and we did not know where to find you in the bush and mother said you were wanted up there anyway but it was awful and i have never been so frightened and i wish you were here i am never frightened when you are near as he looked up into her face he felt he was indeed the deus ex machina of their troubled lives to distract her attention from his godlike qualities which he knew absorbed too much of her thoughts he turned to lessons which had been lately neglected he found that she was well ahead of all that he had set her and after an hour's fresh work he was glad to see that her mind was diverted from personal problems by the insistent vagaries of french verbs when he told her to go to bed she was too tired to make any protest or to linger as she usually tried to do bruce sat on for some time smoking by the kitchen fire before turning in on the stretcher bed that had been prepared for him exactly how they were all going to emerge from the present mess he could not see but the first thing to be done was to get roland restored to health and sanity he thought curiously about him as he sat there wondering if he realized how much of an outsider he was in his own house but it was impossible to guess what the boss saw or suspected or thought he had never given a sign to show that he recognized the possibility of more than met the eye in his home bruce had little clue to the processes of his mind except in relation to business transactions and to men in connection with work in certain ways roland seemed to have come into the world ready-made in others it looked as if he would never learn and never grow it had always interested bruce that he should accept people without question as he found them that with the one exception of his wife he tolerated with good humour all sorts of idiosyncrasies 
all kinds of manners all varieties of moods all species of sins the only kind of criticism bruce had ever seen him pass had been a shrug of the shoulders or an amused twinkle of the eye still pondering over his unique power over men and his curious inconsistencies bruce went to bed the household was asleep in the morning when he went out leaving a note to say he would be back later when he got to point curtis shiny who had been up with roland all night told him they had had a lurid time but bruce found the boss a whining nauseated wreck as feeble as a baby his delirium gone his mind in a stupor of depression they carried him to a boat on a mattress and rowed him up to the bay where he was landed by the men's kitchen and taken to bruce's shanty to be carefully nursed under his directions when he called later in the morning at the boss's house bruce was relieved to see that neither alice nor asia disputed his story that roland was getting better but would have to stay in the bush another day or two he could see they were only too glad to shelve the responsibility of looking after him this made him feel a great pity for the sick man though he understood well enough the reason for alice's relief that evening his story fell to pieces as he sat down by the sitting-room fire with asia who had worn an air of suppressed worry during tea he saw she had something to say alice had hardly left the room for a minute before she burst out with it is he really drunk she asked anxiously Shh, what do you mean bruce looked quickly over his shoulder in the direction of the kitchen door i heard men talking about it down by the store she looked fearfully up at him seeing he was angry you'd no business to listen he said sternly have you said anything about it have you told your mother no she felt her heart jump with fright then don't speak of it to her or to anyone then it's true she said unconsciously raising her voice he was drunk Shh, commanded bruce harshly but it was too late alice stood in the doorway staring at them with hard and startled eyes drunk she repeated so that's the matter with him as he rose to his feet he was gripped by a resentment of her attitude the blind superiority of a good woman for weaknesses that were not her weaknesses i think i'll go and get drunk now she said slowly it is certainly my turn for a second he looked into her passionately scornful face as if he had not understood her while the bitter truth of her words burned into his brain and the hard contempt of her tone stunned his ears as she did not consciously mean her words to apply to him and did not for the moment see that she had included him in her condemnation she was surprised to see him shrink and then turn from her without a word toward the front door as he closed it after him she started forward david she called hoarsely then she remembered asia who now stood up sick with the realization that another dreadful thing was about to happen don't you move from this room cried alice as she rushed out the front door bruce was turning the corner going towards the back gate david she called again as he neither stopped nor turned she began to run after him stumbling though the night was clear with brilliant stars she followed her mind blistered by the scalding thought that she had hurt him in a way he would never forget all that she had recently suffered all the fears of the immediate present even the shock she had just received vanished as she ran and called after the man who would not turn or answer when she seized his arm she had forgotten that she was a christian wife and mother forgotten that she was a lady david you shall not go forgive me i didn't see what i was saying i didn't david i can't bear to think i hurt you i don't care what you do you know i don't oh say you forgive me and forget that i said it i can't have you misunderstand me i'd rather die forgive me her voice broke as she flung herself upon him coming out of his nightmare of pain he found her arms gripped round his neck her eyes wild with a fear that startled him mechanically he clutched at her to keep himself and her from falling that fierce precipitate embrace had not lasted a minute before they were both infected by the fever of it he could not look into her eyes and see what he saw there and remain unmoved the fence against which they leaned and the stars and the night and all sense of time and place were blotted out by the mist that covered his sight a mist wherein he saw only her lips as they inevitably drew his own to them but the very intensity of the abandonment contained the seeds of its rapid disintegration only a few hot minutes had raced by when bruce raised his head and looked over her shoulder into the night 
he felt her eyes fixed for some seconds upon his face then her head nestling into his neck he felt her body hot and trembling against his moving how consciously he could not tell with a seductive ebb and flow of pressure even while he was inflamed by her unmasking of her feelings he realized that he could not encourage her because she lacked the courage of her emotions partly realizing his growing detachment and partly seeing independently the madness of this she drew herself up a little prepared to excuse her emotion or minimize it as his attitude might require when he turned his face to her she could not read the complex mystery of his expression but she did see that there was no dominant light of fierce joy or conquest in his eyes but more than anything else a troubled questioning she looked back at him helplessly leaving him to take the initiative as he did not take it she nervously stammered a question that had nothing to do with the real thoughts of either of them at that moment do you forgive me forgive he repeated absently oh yes please don't mention that again he still had his arms about her and he made no attempt to remove them as he spoke he drew her even a little closer but held her steadily and dispassionately she tried to realize every second of this contact knowing that it could not last as he continued to be silent and look away from her it dawned upon her that her lack of control had only added to his problems suddenly demoralized by this thought she staggered blindly away from him beginning to sob divining the reason for her movement and her tears he caught her back to him and held her more firmly than before stroking her head and pressing it into his neck but still saying nothing it was not long before he had comforted her back to control still forgetting everything but their own immediate problem she looked up at him david i am sorry for this she began with a tragic calmness that was comic she was surprised to see that his eyes smiled at her in the starlight why should you be he asked as he saw she did not know what to say he went on are you really sorry when she turned her face away he took it between his hands looked calmly into it and repeated his question you are not sorry he answered himself and neither am i as her eyes flashed at him he leaned down and kissed her deliberately on the forehead on her hair and then on her mouth you know that i love you he said quietly saying the words he knew she craved to hear and now that we have come to this there is a great deal more to say again he looked past her into the night marveling at the psychology of women in whom love could swamp out so much more thoroughly than in man all other considerations he knew she was saying to herself that nothing mattered now that he had told her he loved her while to him everything mattered just the same as a background to his feelings for her there was a picture of tom roland lying ill in his shanty the picture of a fine enterprise on the point of wreckage the picture of a number of dependent people loyally trusting the man who had made them promises let's go in he said simply it was not till they opened the front door that they remembered asia who was sitting where her mother had left her half crazed by misery bruce groaned when he saw her nothing hurt him so much as the overwhelming sorrows of children he turned from alice to restoring her to peace of mind and for half an hour he devoted himself to putting her to bed and to comforting her so that she would sleep and while he did this alice sat by the sitting-room fire waiting for him and coming back by degrees to a realization of the hard cold facts of life that faced them both at first she was stunned by the complexity of them but she attempted no solution of them her mind balked at what seemed to her the impossibility of fitting them in to any scheme of life that she could face she was proceeding on the assumption that the scene she had just gone through would alter everything not outwardly but in her own mind when bruce came in and closed the door behind him she saw that he was thinking of something else look here my dear we shall really have to keep our troubles away from that child then he saw that she had expected something very different from him he stood on the mat looking down at her the enigma of her strength and her weakness puzzling him afresh even though her face was pinched for lack of sleep it had lost none of its power to attract him now as she looked back at him her cheeks were flushed and her eyes brilliant he knew she was waiting for a lead he wondered if she knew what she really wanted whether she had faced any other kind of future and actually how far he dominated her without attempting to kiss or caress her 
he dropped into the chair opposite. Then, drawing it nearer to her, he leaned forward and took one of her hands. "'What are we to do now?' he asked, his eyes upon hers. "'Why, David, we can't do anything.' In her tone he read finality and renunciation. He knew perfectly well she wanted no scandal, no exposure, that she would never consider running away with him. But he wondered if she had thought about it or faced it, and he was curious to know. "'Have you not thought of going away with me?' he asked lightly. Even as the startled light flashed across her face, she saw he was not serious. "'Don't be alarmed,' he smiled back. "'I'm not going to ask you. I never shall. But just what have you thought about it? You knew we were coming to this, didn't you? I—I I, yes, I—I I thought perhaps—' To her surprise, he laughed. "'Oh, woman!' he said, shaking his head at her. How he could laugh with all that volume of a situation hanging about their ears, she did not know. My dear, you hoped we were coming to this. You meant us to come to this. Yes, you did. You were just like every other woman, and I did too, just like every other man. And now that we are here, the question is, do we stay as we have been, or do we go on, because we have to do one thing or the other? He gripped her hand more firmly, as he went on. There's one thing I must tell you. I cannot go on making love to you in any form here in Tom Roland's house while I take Tom Roland's money. It was inevitable, I think, that we should come to a confession of our feeling for each other. He carefully ignored the fact that she had made the advances. But now we have to make a decision as to action. I can only go on making love to you on one of two conditions. Either I tell your husband and have his consent to go on, which he is hardly likely to give, or we go away. I will not deceive Tom Roland. Even if I don't go round recruiting for the front ranks in heaven, I do have a standard of decency for this earth. He felt her stiffen as she drew herself up. David, I have never thought that I could leave Tom. I, you misunderstand me. I did want to know that you loved me, but I know I can't alter anything. Her voice broke. I know, my dear, he said gently, but we have to be very clear as to exactly what we can do without being disloyal to Tom. Now, I'm no saint, but I cannot go on kissing you as we kiss tonight. I cannot go on telling you I love you, except in a light and dispassionate way. We cannot go on having emotional scenes. All these things will have a physical effect on me. I am not made of ether. If we are to go on safely, we must shut down at once on all thought of drifting. Now the Lord knows how we're going to do it. I don't. But we have to. If we can't, I shall go away. Go away? He saw how her face whitened at the mere suggestion of it. David, would you go away? Oh, my dear. He dropped forward onto his knees, putting his hands into her lap. I do not want to go away. Will you understand me? Will you help me to keep the friendship what it was a year ago? Later, when we have beaten the fever out of it, we can be more expressive. Will you understand that I love you, even if I can't go on telling you, so long as you live with Tom? Will you understand that I am like every other man, that your loving me does not turn me into an ascetic, that I can't stand sex provocation any more than other men can, and that, because I love you, you will stimulate me if you are not careful? I have to be frank, my dear. Women like you don't see these things, or won't admit them till they are thrown at them. Now, are you going to help me? though he had purposely turned his words into an appeal for assistance, as if he were one of the weaker brethren. She was stung by the implied indictment of herself, at the same time that she was moved to heights of renunciation, as she looked down into his questioning face. "'David, I can go on,' she answered proudly. "'I shall never ask you to be any different. I don't want you to be any different. I only want to know you love me. I understand quite well that we can only be the friends we have been.' You will never need to appeal to me again. Unconsciously, her attitude was one of self-defense. He did not dare to smile at her, but took her assurance soberly as he drew himself up and sat back in his chair. Then his manner changed. I want to talk to you about Tom, he began gravely, knowing that he was treading on thin ice. She looked away from him into the fire, realizing with some surprise how completely her husband's last offense had been blotted from her mind and that now that it was brought back to her consciousness, the force of the shock was broken. She was even ready to suspend judgment until Bruce had spoken. So far, 
David Bruce had ignored phases of her married life, about which he knew she had tremendous reserves, even when, as her doctor, he might have spoken without presumption. Though he had nursed her on several occasions, he had never entered her room, save as a professional man, with a manner the more impersonal because he was so privileged. Only once or twice, and that very lightly, he had advised her as to how to deal with her husband. Many times he wanted to speak, but had not found the occasion right. Now he saw that Alice did not resent the fact that he was likely to speak plainly. You needn't be afraid about Tom's taking to drink, wincing as he used the phrase, and not looking at her. He may never do it again. He was temporarily crazed. It's a pity you did not send for Bob that night. Why, David, I can't let outsiders know how he behaves. Behaves? Good Lord, my dear girl. He sat up suddenly, his eyes alight with a rare impatience. Do you suppose he went on like that for fun, or to annoy you, or what? He was facing ruin. He was temporarily maddened, and really there are excuses for him. Do get out of your head the idea that he meant to be a brute to you. Don't be any more hostile to him because he was ill. You know you don't help yourself, or him, by that attitude. She merely looked helplessly at him, and back into the fire. He wanted to get up and shake her out of her extraordinary dumb control. My dear, I'm going to be very frank with you now. You judge Tom too harshly. Your life with him would be more bearable if you realized better the difficulties he has with life. I know he's a trial, and that one has to learn how not to be hurt by a man of his irritable type. You can only learn that by realizing his difficulties. Now you know less about Tom than anyone else. All you can see about him is that he makes you suffer. You think he does it purposely, and for that you almost hate him. He is not rude to you on purpose at all. His irritation is a reaction from strain. He has no idea how much you suffer from it. He would be astonished to find out. If you could grasp that fact, you'd feel less badly about him. He leaned down to put more wood on the fire. And my dear, he has his troubles like the rest of us, and like the rest of us, his worst trouble is himself. A man by his fever of vitality is a victim of his inheritance. But you could resist his pressure if you tried. You don't have to produce his slippers in two seconds when he demands them. Make him wait your time, or go and get them himself occasionally. The whole house doesn't have to hold its breath when he comes in. What do you suppose he could do to you if it didn't? Why, if you turned on him, he would be just as helpless with you as you apparently are with him. You would ruin the best man in the world on the treatment you've given Tom in the last two years. It will be hard work to undo it, but it is what you have to do if you are ever to be at peace with him. And he isn't enjoying the present state of things. He would like it to be different, only he doesn't know how. As he saw she was crying silently, he went down onto his knees again, this time putting his arms round her. My dear, you must stop being hostile to him. That is not fair. If your marriage was a mistake, it is just as hard on him as it is on you, and if you mean to go on with it, you might as well try to make some adjustments. Tom is not rough on purpose. Few people are. You feel so badly about Tom's manners that you are apt to overlook his great qualities. You know, we British are too damn superior about our culture and our refinement, too intolerant of differences. We forget that the pioneers and the sons of pioneers made the world possible for us. If you could get away from Tom a little, and see him as other people see him, and get some independent estimate of him as a character, it might help you. Alice made no attempt to reply to him, but cried on quietly, while he soothed her by stroking her hands and putting them against his cheek. After some time she recovered her control. Where is he, David? she said tragically. In my shanty. We brought him up from Point Curtis this morning. Will you bring him home tomorrow, please? He may not be well enough. He is likely to be pretty sick for some days. She looked down questioningly, he thought. Well, just as soon as he is well enough, will you bring him home? I will. They sat on for some time without another word. With his arm still about her, David Bruce put his head down on her lap, and she put one hand on his hair and kept it there steady. She knew it might be a long time before they would allow themselves the luxury of this moment of intimacy again so she concentrated her attention upon it, that she might carry the memory forward to help her to ward off the menace of the future. At last Bruce moved and looked at his watch, remembering Roland. Getting up, he drew her with him, 
and holding her face near to his looked steadily into her eyes still silent he kissed her on the forehead and then firmly on the lips before he stood up away from her i must go and look after him for an hour or two it will be late when i get back you go to bed and remember that you need only live one minute at a time with a smile that always warmed her and eliminated the fear of evil moments he turned and left her to piece together for herself once more the puzzle of a fresh beginning end of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of the story of a new zealand river by jane mander this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fifteen the next morning alice sent asia for eliza king who came at once and took the children home with her it was late in the afternoon before the boss was carried up on a stretcher he was still too ill to know where he was or what had happened to him it was alice's first experience of him as a sick man and she felt the new sensation of pity for him as she leaned over his white strangely silent face for the next three days while she nursed him she revolved over and over in her mind bruce's words wondering if she could ever become sufficiently indifferent to him to be able to live comfortably in spite of the incompatibilities on the fourth morning as roland appeared to be much better bruce said he would go to the bush for the day i think he is all right now he may sleep a good deal don't wake him on any account if you want anything send for bob i might not get down before eight or nine as alice watched him go she marvelled that they could have ignored as they had done in the last three days the great moments of that night and it brought home to her the fact that life was possible after all that one did not sit down and die so easily and that the will to live had a useful friend in compromise an hour after he had left she went softly to the bedroom door which was propped open for a few inches the blinds had been drawn leaving the room almost dark alice listened carefully but heard no sounds of tossing or moaning when she came again later she heard the low sounds of the heavy sleeper with a sigh of thankfulness she returned to the kitchen at intervals during the day she listened at the door always with the same result when about five o'clock she stood once more something she never knew what arrested her and made her catch her breath and turn sick tom roland had always slept heavily and noisily usually snoring and moaning by turns but alice detected something entirely new about this breathing and with a sudden presentiment she rushed to the windows and drew up the blinds the setting sun shining straight in and reflected on the river colored the inside walls and lit up every corner she turned to the bed where her husband lay on his back with his mouth open his face was bluish-gray and strangely loose and withered hardly knowing why she snatched at the blankets uncovering an empty laudanum bottle she recoiled as if it had been a revolver aimed at herself then she stared at it and from it to him for some minutes she was utterly unable to think she stood like a graven image with sightless eyes turned upon him then by degrees came the questions how much had he taken and when had he taken it was he dying would anything save him if he died what then and then her cheeks blanched her eyes hardened her lips set why not let him die she did not know what to do to save him david bruce might not be back for hours would that time make all the difference she need not have discovered the laudanum or suspected the nature of his breathing she was obeying bruce's instructions by leaving him alone who would ever know if she walked out of that room leaving things as they had been and said nothing she staggered to the window that looked down the river and threw up the lower sash which had been closed to keep the blind from flapping she saw nothing but the blurred blaze of the sinking sun like a great fringed splotch of crimson upon a gray sea was he dying did even the minutes matter she drew her hand over her eyes oh god she groaned but she was not thinking of god the vision in the mist that swept over her eyes held the sad tired accusing face of david bruce she rushed to the door asia she called sharply yes mother from the kitchen go down to the store and ask mr hargraves to come here at once as the child ran out alice dropped onto the sitting-room sofa feeling that she would faint but she pulled herself together 
as she heard bob scrambling up the path and although white she was calm as she met him at the door could you find mr bruce in the bush for me she asked yes certainly then please go at once and get him here as soon as you can and do not say a word to any one about it you may trust me mrs roland he answered anxiously realizing from her face that it was a desperate business and without waiting for further information he rushed off for the kitchen and a horse what is it mother gasped asia who panted back as bob raced off is father worse he seems to be but don't say anything about it uncle david will be here presently you go on getting the tea alice's voice sounded strange to herself and in a day she walked back into the bedroom wondering if there was anything else she ought to do she tried to think of someone at the bay who would know what to do and then she remembered that she dare not tell them she felt instinctively that it must not get out the braytons she could trust them she wrote a hurried note asking for advice and asking mrs brayton to keep asia if she could send harold brayton back she felt terribly alone as she watched the child running up the green hill every little sound about the house made her jump when she found herself looking back over her shoulder with swift fear she knew it was time to set her teeth against a possible collapse as she stood in the kitchen again she realized that she could not stay alone in any room wondering what was happening that she would have to go in and face it once she began to walk to her room she felt better and when she stood beside the bed she was amazed to find she could look calmly even coldly upon the man who lay dying there for the first time since her marriage she felt herself entirely detached from him up to this time she had been unable to see him to any extent as others saw him the others had not had to feed him or sleep with him while for almost the whole of their married life she had known him only as an irritable and irregular eater a restless sleeper and a man who had made their intimate relations merely a continuous performance of abruptly passionate acts they had never read a book together he did not like music once or twice when she had pointed out a sunset to him he had said hm, not bad and had jerked on to something else his presence had always meant irritation tenseness uncertainty his absence a blessed relief and yet she had always known that men trusted him and admired him she knew that the world saw in him a great driving force a reliable friend a generous enemy the soul of business honor and she had grown almost to hate him she knew as bruce had said that it was because he made her suffer because he had dominated her because she had been afraid of him that poor thing that lay there dying she had come in the last three days to see that perhaps after all he did not realize how she suffered that it was indeed largely her own fault and as she looked at him she wondered how she could ever have been afraid of him he looked so pitifully harmless and then there was the hard cold fact that she had seen before bruce had put it into words the fact that he was not happy either what had she ever done for him that could not have been done by a housekeeper or another and he had certainly expected something more of her though this was not the first time she had met this question it came to her now with the force of a revelation she had wronged him in marrying him more than he had wronged her because she had doubted from the beginning the results in which he believed and hoped but it was more than anything else the fact that he was dying that killed her hostility to him and the fact that he had meant to die brought home to her the misery he must have faced had he been afraid had life seemed impossible to him he had always seemed like life incarnate she had never thought of death in connection with him or of fear when she turned from him to go out into the dusk her battle with him was more than half won she knew that if he lived he could never again hurt her as he had hurt her in the past as she opened the front door and looked towards the mountain there was enough light for her to see a horseman coming out of the bush at a headlong gallop down the road beside the tramway something about that mad race against time stirred her out of the coma into which she had fallen and lifted her spirits she was ready for action ready for anything when bruce dashed up to the gate it's tom as he leaped from the steaming horse he's taken laudanum i didn't know what to do with one eloquent look at her he sprang up the steps leaving her to fasten his horse pulling the bedclothes off the boss's body bruce put his ear to his heart he soon saw that he was nearly gone so nearly that it was doubtful if anything could save him as he realized it he pulled himself up 
and as he looked down upon roland his teeth set his hands clenched and the veins stood out on his face only he could save the boss and he did not know that he could and nobody would ever know if he did not for a moment while temptation strangled his will he stood stiff then he swept his hand across his eyes as if to ward off some unseen terror and the power of decision returned he raised his head quickly to see alice standing in the doorway with her eyes glued upon him he had only to look at her to see that she knew what he had just been through and that she had been through it first but he dare not lose minutes when did he take it he asked hoarsely i don't know david when did you find it out she knew why he asked about five o'clock he knew that was true and he saw that her fight too had been short an emetic mustard and warm water at once i'll get that you find me a big cork he jerked the words out as she followed him into the kitchen we must get brighton here we can trust him i've sent asia there is someone coming now it's he good he looked through the window bob's following we can trust him we'll need them both he found what he wanted as he talked and he was ready when Harold Brayton's horse stopped snorting at the back gate. Alice's lips trembled as she met him. Thank you, she mumbled. With a sympathetic gesture, he gripped her hand and looked from her to Bruce. God, I'm glad to see you, Brayton. Hope you can stay all night. That's good. Come and help me now. Mrs. Rowland, when Bob comes, please tell him to fix up Harold's horse in the yard here and give him a feed and take his own and mine to the stalls and then come back. Alice sat down dazed, feeling as if she were in a dream she did hope there would be something for her to do then she remembered that the men would have to eat and she began mechanically to prepare a meal much more substantial than the one asia had set on the kitchen table in the bedroom bruce looked anxiously at roland's blue face i don't think he has much of a chance brayton but his extraordinary vitality may die hard we'll make him sick with mustard and water if possible and then we'll have to walk him up and down till he wakes if it takes all night we'll get him outside it's warm enough by the time bob returned from seeing to the horses they were ready to drag roland's inert body out of doors as he entered the kitchen bob held out a telegram this has just come from kaiwaka mrs roland it was given to me at the stable alice opened it indifferently as she looked at her husband's name on the outside bob who stood waiting for instructions was upset to see that she dropped into a chair on the verge of tears hearing bruce's voice he went into the sitting-room still unaware of the cause of this summons he stopped startled when he saw roland propped up between the two men bob you can be trusted i know said bruce quietly the boss has taken laudanum we mayn't be able to save him but if we do and it got out it would lower his credit pretty badly shake confidence in him in the future you understand so it must never be hinted at i understand just help us out with him and then mrs roland will give you a meal we shall have to take it in turns to eat and rest when they got outside bob told him of the telegram i'll go in for a minute he answered alice who was crying with her head on the table pushed the yellow paper towards him without a word taking it up he saw that it was signed by the secretary of the colliery timber company when he read it through he understood why she cried it told roland that the company would stand by him in his recent loss that it would advance payments on its new contracts with him and finance him further if necessary and that he was to go ahead with confidence with the work on his mill saying nothing he merely put his hand on her shoulder before going outside bob waited for half an hour before going in again rather nervously he told alice that bruce had sent him for something to eat and he was almost alarmed when she asked him to sit down with her for she was not famous for her approachableness but she began at once with a simplicity and directness that surprised herself let us talk about something cheerful bob tell me about the girl you're going to marry she surprised him into shyness but when he saw after a few questions that she was really interested he produced a photo from his vest pocket alice looked into the sweet fresh girlish face with a sudden swelling in her throat she's far too good for me said bob humbly and i hate to bring her to a far-off place like this but i told her about you and she said she guessed if you could stand it she could she looked through misty eyes at bob's young decent face seeing him afresh i shall be very glad to have her here bob when does she come well i don't know exactly mrs roland as soon as i can get the house built anyway 
as she handed him a cup of tea across the table she remembered that he was one of the men who were waiting for wages wages that now he might never get but at her first reference to it he brushed it aside and seeing that he was helping her he continued to talk of his plans for his future home as she sat alone after he had gone out alice wondered why she had ever been afraid of a strange place and human beings in a little while harold brayton came in anxiously sympathetic still a hope he said gravely as he sat down he did not offer useless sympathy and being without a cheerful topic that he could suitably introduce he sat and ate with an awkward silence he was much more vividly conscious of the tragedy in the house than bob had been and less able to be diverted from it alice had to exert herself in order to save them both from embarrassment after he had gone she began to listen for david bruce she heard the slow dragging steps from the front to the back the pause while they turned the same shuffling to the front the pause again there was something indescribably weird about the low monotony of it about that desperate tramp to cheat death hovering overhead when at last she heard bruce's steps at the back door she rose to meet him with a curious apathy but he read the question in her eyes in spite of it i can't say yet he will not be out of danger for hours as he dropped into the chair opposite her he felt her unusual detachment and guessed that her mind was so satiated with adversity that she could not suffer any more in silence she poured him out a cup of strong coffee and he noticed that she did not look at him as he commenced to eat and drink after some minutes he felt her eyes fixed upon him with a look that was so insistent that he had to raise his face even though he made an effort not to david why couldn't we let him die he was startled by her matter-of-fact tone as much as by the frankness of her question he stopped eating and looked thoughtfully at the fire for a minute before answering yes indeed why couldn't we that is an interesting question he answered slowly you could have done it and i should never have known i could do it still and no one would ever know and we both want him to die they looked at each other across the table they were both dulled by weariness and the recent rapid march of domestic events to a point where they could make no further demonstration of feeling and yet they felt at that moment as they had never felt before that they were united for all time bound by bonds immeasurably stronger than the kisses of passion or the vows of emotional moments well smiled bruce she did not try to answer what stopped you he asked lightly did you think of god no i thought of you oh much the same thing he said with a wicked little chuckle she could not help smiling what stopped you david she asked after a minute she wondered why his face suddenly became grave did you think of me david he drank two mouths full of coffee before replying no i dare not then he looked into the fire when he went on slowly then looking into the fire he went on slowly i thought of the men who have trusted him and i thought he turned his eyes to hers with a tragic appeal i remember that once years ago i let a man die in much the same way alice did not start nor did the expression in her eyes change as she returned his look the abnormal stillness deepened round them till the sound of the dragging steps outside shuffled back into their consciousness again for a woman david her tone held no hint of judgment yes how old were you twenty-four and i had been drinking did she ever know yes she never told anyone but she sent me flying it was her husband yes how old was she about thirty-five thirty-five and you were twenty-four in her tone he read a damning indictment but not for him a flash of flame swept her eyes as she got up moving swiftly round the table she dropped onto her knees beside him and put her head on his lap he set his teeth against a swirl of emotion oh get up dear please alice raised a quiet and tearless face and without a word she went back to her chair and looked into the fire david bruce knew that henceforth her love for him would be rounded out with fuller understanding with difficulty he ate a few more mouthfuls then he stood up she rose at once and came and stood opposite him he thought that pale though she was he had never seen her look as beautiful as she did then with her eyes shining at him seizing her hands he raised them to his lips god dear it's good to be understood and forgiven one's sins 
Her eyes filled, but she did not try to speak, and he left her standing thus, her face a beacon for the night. She sat still by the fire for half an hour before she cleared and reset the table, and made up the fire, knowing it would be her task to wait on the men during the night. When Bob Hargraves came in, she sent him down to lie in Asia's room. Later, she dozed at intervals on the sitting-room sofa, sleeping more than she could have supposed possible. Once or twice changes were made in the night without arousing her. She felt no excitement, no suspense. She knew, long before they brought Tom Roland in at dawn, that he was saved. End of chapter 15「Sixteen of the Story of a New Zealand River by Jane Mander. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Sixteen. Asia was eighteen. For months, the inevitable fact that she would be eighteen had dominated her thoughts, and her mother, watching her, sensed with her uncanny aptitude for presentiment that something was in the air. What that something was, she feared so much that she refused to think about it. Now, Asia's birthday was two weeks behind her, and Alice had seen for days that the dread something was fast approaching. As she paced the beach below the cliffs one evening, with the river running silently beside her under the cool spring stars, she knew she was only indulging in her old habit of putting off the evil hour. As she walked, she hated the thought that old habits could still dominate her. She hated her own exhaustless capacity for suffering. She hated her terrible dependence on the people she loved. She hated her inability to be just where she suffered. At last, shivering, but not with cold, she set her face homewards. Ahead of her, across the river, she saw the moving lantern of the mill watchman going his rounds, and the red lamps on the ends of the wharves, and the headlights of a big Australian bark that moored to one of them. Tom Roland's dream was coming true. He had built his mill and enlarged it, and was considering enlarging it again. Almost as fast as the logs could be run down from the bush, they were sawn and loaded into the timber vessels that now came from all parts of the world in a continuous procession up the river. By day, the whole bay vibrated with the whistle and screech of the circular saws, the tear of the breakdowns, the rasp of the drags, the rattling of chains on the skids, the hum of the belting, the scream and clank of the donkey engines as they loaded flitches into the voracious holds of the ships, and, as a running accompaniment to all of these, the triumphant roar of the great engines that drove every wheel and chain and belt. The shutting off of all this fuss and buzz now intensified the silence of the nights. Even Alice was conscious, as she walked home, of the absence of the throb of the engines, of the vacant stillness of the hushed machinery. The intermittent sounds of the night were dwarfed by the memory of the day's loud speech. She heard, as it were, from a long way off, snatches of song from the bark, and the sounds of an accordion played somewhere at the head of the bay. She turned wearily round the cliffs, and proceeded to climb steps now cut in the clay up the bank to a path above which joined at the boss's front gate with the old path leading directly down to the store. She paused several times, trying to fortify herself with the freshness of the night. Once she lingered, listening to the cry of the new baby, the second, at Bob Hargrave's house, a chain or two on the other side of the store path. As she stood, sweet scents floated down to her from the shrubs and flowers that now hid the foundations of her home. Roland's picnicking days were over, and with the prospect of prosperity, he had been willing to make of his house something more of a setting for his increasing success. The year before, he had practically rebuilt the whole structure. A narrow central hall now ran from the front door to a large lean-to containing a porch, a scullery, and a bathroom fitted with a tin tub, the latter creating a precedent for the entire northern end of the Auckland province. The distinction it gave to his house in the eyes of passing travellers was a source of great satisfaction to the boss. Two bedrooms had also been inserted into the middle of the cottage, just behind the enlarged front rooms. Alice would have appreciated the changes much more if she had been consulted, or any notice taken of her wishes. But the only people whose advice Roland had deigned to consider were Mrs. Brayton, Bruce, and Asia. It was Asia who had had most to do with the scheme of interior decoration. Each stage in the furnishing of the rooms represented a stage in her artistic development, and each stage 
was the result of a visit to the Hardings, now removed to Auckland, and of explorations into the latest fads from America, which country largely influenced the evolution of household art in New Zealand. As Roland was not as susceptible to the progressive nature of art, or as inclined to take it seriously as Asia was, he could be persuaded each time to impose only a little of the new upon the old, with the result that the patterns of the wallpapers and the linoleum did not always agree, nor did the furniture balance properly in the room space, nor did the colors always harmonize. But Asia had high hopes of some day seeing it as a perfect whole. At first Alice had been enthusiastic about the changes, but later she resented them. She could not see why it should be good to have a flowered wallpaper admired at one time, only to have it scorned and discarded for a tinted one three years later. If it was beautiful once, why was it not beautiful for ever? Mrs. Brayton's wonderful rooms had not changed since the day they had first seen them. But in spite of her, and it was this that hurt, the evolution of art in the house on the cliffs proceeded. From the beginning she had been so thankful herself for every hard-won addition to mere comfort and convenience that the claims of art seemed ridiculous. For a person who had a passion for one great art, she was singularly indifferent to others. Also, it seemed hard to her that Asia should be given money to make a show when she had had to fight for every inch of comfort she had ever gained. It was not that she was jealous of Asia. It was rather that Asia's success at managing people, and particularly Roland, brought home to her her own continued failure in this direction. It was true that she now got on much better with her husband. With success, he was less irritable, and in ways he had become more considerate, particularly she had noticed during the last year. But she knew that her victories had been mostly Asia's victories. One instance came again to her memory, as she stopped for the last time before entering, outside the fence, at the corner by the cliffs. It had been their first fight to get help in the house, help that was badly needed, as Alice grew less able to do her share. Asia was fourteen when she first began to question whether washing Roland's heavy flannels was part of the fixed duty of woman. Alice, though physically and temperamentally unfit for housework, had never protested against anything, realizing that it was all in her marriage contract, and she told Asia it was no use to resent it. But Asia was a young rebel, fast developing a fierce hostility to anything that savored of a law or an order. And finally she drove her mother into asking Roland for extra money to pay for help. "'Good heavens! What are the girls doing?' he demanded. "'If they want luxuries of that kind, where will it end? And Alice had succumbed immediately, and had wept about it in secret. Asia stood it for a few weeks longer, and then one morning, when the flannels were heavier and dirtier than usual, she had burst in a white heat upon Tom Roland, who happened to be lying late in bed, and had told him that his flannels and his boots would stay dirty in future unless he got someone in to clean them. He had stared back in amazement at her raging face, and then a flicker of amusement crossed his eyes. "'Holy Moses!' he snorted. "'If it's as bad as all that, get two washerwomen. "'You don't know how to manage him, mother,' said Asia, wisely, later in the day. That stung Alice to make a stand that night, when her husband tried to get even with her. He had said only a few words when she turned on him. "'You stop annoying me about nothing,' she commanded, and turned half-dressed, walked out of the room, and left him alone for the night, to digest his astonishment as best he could.' No one was more surprised than she was at the happy results of this incident. Asia calmly requisitioned one of the men's wives for all the washing and heavy cleaning, sending for her sometimes two days a week, and never again was a word said. There was one thing for which Alice was supremely grateful to her husband. Never had he given a sign to show that he misunderstood her friendship with David Bruce. Though she knew they gave him no real cause for jealousy, she was none the less surprised at his apparent indifference to the amount of time they saw each other. She rightly took this to be a tribute more to Bruce than to herself, and it was one thing that was independent of Asia's influence. For three years now, Alice had felt something growing between herself and the child she idolized. It had begun with Asia's first visit to the Hardings in Auckland, and it had increased by later visits, and especially by the theatre going that had risen up like a bogey to affright Alice. In vain, Bruce told her that every girl got stage-mad and got over it. In vain, Asia told her mother 
that she was not going to the dogs because she loved plays. The unforgettable fact was that Asia continued to go to plays, even though she knew it hurt her mother. Alice knew she had slipped into some other world of thought and was shaping herself by a philosophy that she feared, and it was the end of all this that she feared. And somehow, in her mind, the beginning of the end had become associated with Asia's eighteenth birthday. It was because she had felt it coming nearer that she had gone out this spring night to try to bring herself to face it. After closing the front door behind her, Alice stood in the hall listening. The stillness of the house seemed ominous. She moved to the sitting room, and when she saw Asia sitting alone by the fire, she had the feeling of a creature trapped by something that has lain in wait for it. Hearing her there, Asia raised a pale and uneasy face towards her. Mother, I want to talk to you. She tried to make her voice casual, but it sounded strained. Throwing off her cape, Alice walked slowly to her chair on the other side of the hearth, her face growing whiter. Where are the girls? she asked weakly, feeling that she wanted no interruptions. Betty and Mabel, who were now thirteen and eleven, were no longer referred to as the children. They've gone to bed. Asia leaned down to put more wood on the fire. Is Tom home? No, he won't be back tonight. He has sent word. Alice sat down, seeing Asia through a mist. The worst thing of all about this, to her, was the sense of her own utter helplessness to prevent or postpone or alter by one fraction the purpose of the clear, fearless, arrogantly youthful eyes that looked up in her with a tragic pity. Asia was beautiful, with a radiant vitality that stung everyone to life when she entered a room. Her features were not classic like her mother's, nor faultlessly regular like the ideal of the adolescent, for they were too strong. But she had a fine white skin, delicately tinted, eyes with the subtle draw of deep pools, and masses of soft gold hair that waved with a dozen tints as she moved. She was eager and hungry for life and beauty, voracious for adventure, tremendously sure of herself and her right to live as she pleased. She had no conception of the chasm that separated her at eighteen from her mother, either at the same age or now, but she knew only too well the likely effect of what she now had to say. The attempts she had made to show her mother whither she was tending only convinced her it was best to wear a mask, and when the inevitable break came, to make it as short as she could. For years she had lived more closely to Mrs. Brayton and to Bruce than she had lived to her mother. She realized the tragedy of it. She knew what she had meant in her home. She knew what a blank she would leave behind. As she looked at her mother's head bowed to the fire, she saw afresh what the years had done to that drooping figure and that pale, proud face, mellowed and more gracious, certainly, and in ways more beautiful than ever. She wondered if she would ever solve the everlasting enigma of strength and weakness behind those suffering eyes. She set her teeth on the thought that she was now going to add to the gray hairs, the lines, and the droop. As she braced herself to speak, her mother raised her face with a manner suggestive of noble resignation. Well, she said patiently. Oh, mother, began Asia miserably, I know I'm going to hurt you dreadfully, but, oh, please, do try to understand. Alice resented the implication that she might not understand all the more because she knew it was deserved. What is it? she asked coldly, inviting the worst. I want to go away. I want to earn my own living. I want to see the world. Yes? They were both looking into the fire. Those three sentences were what Alice had feared to hear, and she felt her heart set in her chest like a ball of plaster. Asia had known beforehand that she would get no help, but she had determined to say everything there was to be said as shortly as possible. She clenched her hands on her knees, for she knew the look in her mother's eyes was just as bad as she had expected it would be. It isn't a new thing, mother. I've wanted it for years, but I made up my mind I would wait till I was eighteen. I've thought about it till I've been sick. I know what it will mean to you, but I cannot help it. I must go. I can't be a parasite. I just can't. A flood of shame swept over Alice's face, and blinding tears rushed to her eyes, but Asia did not look at her as she forced herself on jerkily. And I want to see the world. It's all so wonderful to me, and I'm not afraid, and I know I can get on. You needn't worry about me, and, of course, I will come home to see you, but I can't stay here any longer. I have used this place up. 
I've breathed every breath there is to be got out of it. I would have gone two years ago but for you. I have thought of you. I've tried to tell you, but you wouldn't listen, and so I went on keeping it to myself till I couldn't any longer. I had to tell others, Uncle David and Mrs. Brayton. Alice sat up stiffly. You've told them first? I had to tell somebody, Mother. The pain of this hardened Alice. And what do you think you can do? She asked with a shade of scorn. Asia winced, but kept anger out of her eyes and voice. I have music. Yes, so had I. Well, Mother, I've got to try, even if I fail. And I won't fail. Oh, you foolish child, what do you know of the world? If there ever was a question better designed to make youth hate age and fight it, it is not on record. Asia bit back the words that leapt to her lips. If she had not been so conscious of her mother's misery, she would have said things that neither of them would have forgotten. If I don't know anything of the world, she replied quietly, it's time I began to learn, considering I have to live in it. And may I ask how you are going to begin? Do you think you can capture the world in a week? No, mother, I'm not quite mad. I'm going to the Hardings. They will help me. Oh, I see. They know, too. All trace of tears now left Alice. Henceforth she was frozen. Yes, I wrote to them. They think I can get on. The world is different from what it was when you tried. Mother, do see that. Do understand. Everybody helps women today, and it's nothing for a girl to earn her own living. Oh, isn't it? You don't know anything about life and men. You don't know what girls have to put up with, especially when they, they look like you. You don't know yourself or how clever men can fool you and lie to you. A good many women seem to survive it, mother. I don't see why I shouldn't. I'm not afraid, and if I make mistakes, I will learn. I'm not going to the devil. Her proud self-confidence angered her mother. How little you know what you're talking about. You've lived a sheltered life here. You've had no chance to learn what men can be, or how you yourself can feel. A curious smile flitted across Asia's eyes. Getting up suddenly, she walked to the window and looked out into the darkness. Her sheltered life. She smiled as she thought of it, of crude, rapidly arrested scenes with sunny shoremen, of staggeringly sudden and unexpected caresses on the part of various men, a Kaiwaka curate, a surveyor, an English derelict working on the gum fields, and others, and of her own adolescent passion for David Bruce, not yet out of her system. All this Asia saw as she stood by the window, and she felt that if there was anything she did not know about men, it could only be something unexpectedly agreeable. As she turned back to the fire, Alice saw in her face that arrogant cocksureness of youth that so irritates the wisdom of age. If I am ever to marry mother, she said, sitting down, it seems to me I might as well know something about myself and men, or perhaps you have pigeonholed me as an old maid. She did not mean to be scornful, but her mother resented her tone. Ah, oh, well, it's useless my saying anything I know, but you will learn. She could not avoid superiority. That's what I'm going for, mother. For God's sake, understand. You must have realized that I would go some day. Why do you put me in the wrong like this? But Alice was suffering too much now to unbend. All she wanted was the hard, cold fact. How are you going to get the money to begin? Uncle David is lending it to me. This was the unkindest cut of all. It looked like treachery. I see. And when do you go? By the next boat, mother. Alice rose abruptly, her face turned to stone. Ignoring Asia's appealing gesture, she walked proudly into her bedroom and shut and locked the door. She never undressed or slept, or wept all night. Asia sat on, slow tears dripping from her cheeks. After a while, she stole out into the back garden, but, as if powerless to move any further, she leaned against the wash-house and sobbed helplessly. As a late moon rose over Pukekaroro, she walked to the side gate and leaned upon it, looking at the mountain. He reminded her of the nights and early mornings, of the moon rises and the dawns, when she and her mother, watching by sick or dying babies, had turned their faces together towards his inscrutable calm. She remembered the other things they had shared, how together they had looked for the spring's first golden glory on the kofi trees, how together they had listened for the first Tui's song and rejoiced over the first violet. How together they had watched many red suns go down beyond the river gap. How together they had played and loved Beethoven. And she knew 
that she more than anyone else had always been there like the impossible friend in the melodrama always on the spot to share the good and the bad and why could she not have kept on doing it for ever why why end of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of the story of a new zealand river by jane mander this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seventeen mrs brayton sat back on the big lounge in front of her library fire an open book on her lap her reading spectacles the only kind of artificial aid she deigned to use on the end of her nose for some time she had sat thus listening for steps in the garden the light from her reading lamp rivaling that of the dancing flames upon her faded silk gown the night outside was filled with a soft soughing of the wind in the pines which to-night seemed to the old lady to be more melancholy than usual when at last she heard the crunching on the shells a look of animation shot into her eyes and she straightened herself up when alone she had to admit to herself that she was growing old but she was determined that she would not yet be old in public her blue eye was almost as keen as ever and her manner had kept its fire and her body its poise come in she said rising at the tap on the window asia entered like a blast of river wind she was hatless as usual her hair tossed about her face her eyes feverish her cheeks burning her breath hurried from her fast walk she took the old lady's hand bent and kissed her lace and ribbon cap in a courtly fashion looked for a moment into her eyes and with a gesture that was both tragic and comical dropped beside her on to the lounge mrs brayton whom no storms could ever more ruffle preserved her serene ease and while waiting for asia to get her breath she rose again to put wood on the fire after a second's abstraction asia bounded to her feet took the tongs from her and fussed with the fire till there was a fine blaze the action relieved her dropping back into one of her tangled and unladylike attitudes she drew her hand over her eyes thank god she exclaimed by tomorrow night it will all be over mrs brayton turned to her prepared to listen i would have come down my dear but david said it was better not oh lord yes i've never known anything so awful as these last two days i don't know what has come to mother the potter went to the bush yesterday saying he would not be back for a week he hates a gloomy atmosphere betty and mabel are scared to death and even bunty is subdued the house is like a morgue and that foolish mother of mine like an avenging angel all because i want to do a perfectly natural and rational thing oh how is it that human beings can be so silly she drew herself up trying to hide her own emotion under a veil of disgust seeing the old lady's eyes fixed questioningly upon her she went on oh i've felt granny but i've felt all i'm going to feel there's a limit and if she had been different it would have broken me up to go but she has made me hard all i want now is to get the beastly business over what is the matter with mother anyway it's being a mother that's the trouble replied mrs brayton softly oh nonsense all mothers are not like that i'm sure you never were asia saw a swift pain shoot into the eyes under the lace cap and realizing that she had scored some never mentioned wound she pretended not to see and raced on jerkily i know what i've meant to mother i know what she means to me but i can't live buried in my mother nor she in me i want so much more than just one person and i have waited and i have suppressed myself i'm not rushing off at the first impulse i've done everything i could to please her been a beastly hypocrite and lied Ugh! and i've managed her husband for her and i'm not leaving her alone or in a hole of any kind things are better at home than they ever have been the girls are growing up and elsie is three and no more sign of babies i've thought it all out and i've waited you don't think i'm a brute do you no the old lady had recovered her composure under this torrent it can't have come as a shock to her she must have seen it coming and she's not going to be alone when she has you and uncle david fancy any woman thinking herself ill-used when she has uncle david she paused and instantly the silence became significant then she turned to mrs brayton with one of her characteristic whirls i want to ask you something she said the old lady's eyes smiled a permission to proceed have you ever thought about them wondered why what do you mean the keen eyes narrowed a little about their friendship i mean 
I've often wanted to ask you. They're a mystery to me. She stared abstractedly into the fire. A mystery, repeated Mrs. Brayton. Yes, they must love each other. I'm sure they do. But whether there's ever been anything, I can't say. And it's been so easy for them. The potter away such a lot. And when I've gone out in the evening, I've said where I was going and how long I'd be away. Child! exclaimed the old woman aghast. What? Why? Wasn't that sensible? Sensible? Oh, ye gods, and this is the child, the unsophisticated country child. Mrs. Brayton stared at her, too amazed to be shocked. It's the result of your teaching, yours and Uncle David's. There was a twinkle in Asia's eyes. Oh, child, how can you say that? You have moved, I think, a little faster than either of us suspected. Well, my home has been the sort of place that one would move in, if one could move at all, replied Asia grimly. Isn't mother enough to make you think? Is there anything slow about Tom Roland? Why don't our parents realize that we children have eyes to see and ears to hear? I slept for years with only a thin wall between my parents and me. Slept, did I say? I sat up for hours, shivering, sick and faint. I cried, I prayed, I raged. I grew old listening to them. I grew to have a pity, and then a contempt for them both, and then just a tolerance. I couldn't understand, and I don't understand now, how human beings can be so stupid and so cruel and make so much unhappiness for each other. Why did mother stand it? What good does it do to stand things? She never made him any better. Oh, she's a mystery to me. Having nothing to say, Mrs. Brayton sat still. Mother has taught me one great lesson. I'm done with misery. I shall have nothing more to do with it as long as I live. I shall train my mind to ignore it. I won't cease to help people or to be sympathetic. But I'm not going to suffer over anybody any more. I shall be like Uncle David. He never worries about anything. Well, if you can manage it as well as he does, smiled the old lady. Oh, I shall. He's a wonder. He has even improved Mother. She must love him. And if there hasn't been anything between them, how, how could she resist him? She lowered her eyes, flushing suddenly. Child, murmured Mrs. Brayton breathlessly, feeling as if she were getting out of her depth. But no water was too deep for Asia, who had more than a nodding acquaintance with deep waters. I have loved him, you know, she went on, taking up one of the shriveled hands. Really loved him, I mean, not only the hero-worship business. He could have done anything with me he liked, lots of times, in the last year or two. I've been quite helpless. That's one reason why I wanted to go away before. I'm getting over it a little now. I know what it feels like. And if mother feels the same about him, and if he kisses her, well. Unconsciously, she crushed Mrs. Brayton's hand till the rings cut her fingers. The old lady was astounded by this revelation. Feeling her silence, Asia turned from gazing at the fire. Why are you surprised? she demanded. Oh, child, didn't you know I loved him? Why, yes, but not in that way. And why not in that way? Don't we have feelings, passions? Oh, my dear, passion is too strong a term for eighteen to use. But it's a biological necessity that eighteen feels, retorted Asia grimly. And why do you lend me books on sex and biology, you too, if you don't expect me to study the facts of life? She glared at the old lady. Oh, my dear, of course you may read books. I see, but I must not apply their information rationally to life. Well, with a suspicion of a twinkle in her eye, a personal experience is a very different thing from scientific statements in books. Do you think I don't know that? Asia drew herself up till she towered over the bent figure on the lounge. But the statements in books are to prepare us for life. You prepare me for life, and then you are amazed that I begin to live. You grown-up people amuse me. You think you own a monopoly over experience, and that you ought to. She drew her knees up to her chin without apology, balanced herself on the edge of the lounge, and stared into the fire. It's perfectly natural that I should have fallen in love with Uncle David. Anybody would fall in love with him. All the girls around the place are silly about him. They hang around watching for him, and some of the married women, too. Why, he's the only man in the place. But he never looks at anybody but Mother, and nobody knows how he looks at her. Asia, my dear, Mrs. Brayton sat up very straight. I think you are seeing things that do not exist. Your mother and David have a rare and beautiful friendship, a spiritual friendship. You have no right to think into it something that is not there, just because you feel too deeply. Why, 
it's because i feel that i know how they could if they wanted to and i don't see why they shouldn't want to oh my dear look here granny asia bounded to her feet and stood with her back to the fire here you have been educating me for years to understand unusual situations and to discriminate and now when i apply my knowledge to the facts under my nose you try to put me in the wrong you know mother does not love her husband you know he does not love her you know how he lives you know that mother and uncle david care for each other you know they have all sorts of opportunities and you profess to be amazed that i see it that i understand it just because i am only eighteen i'm not morbid about it i'm not curious i'm only interested i'm not jealous he's the only thing worth while that poor mother has ever had i'm only too glad for her to have him and that's why it's so hard to have her unkind to me her voice broke unexpectedly and she dropped back onto the lounge burying her face in her hands mrs brayton put a sympathetic hand upon her knee presently asia recovered and tossed back her crumpled hair granny she said grimly i'm no babe you know i have told you about some of the men who have begun to make love to me and i knew how to take care of myself i know more about men than you think more about all of us the fact is we human beings are not a lot of book heroes or devils we are animals more or less veneered and the sooner we see it the better as uncle david says tom roland is a victim of overmuch vitality the pity is that he didn't marry mrs lyman instead of mother that's just the matter good heavens why did she marry him i have never dared ask her since i was a small child mrs brayton had no astonishment left to spend upon this latest wisdom and she turned helplessly away from the question can you imagine why she married him persisted asia why why do most people marry my child she evaded do you believe she loved him i don't see why not he's very attractive to many women oh i think she was just lonely and afraid and he dominated her poor mother they sat silent for some minutes you know asia began again i've often wondered what my father was like he must have been a more joyous soul than mother perhaps an awful scamp and that's why she would never speak about him perhaps asia looked curiously at the old lady feeling she knew more than she would say and wondering idly what it was but only idly for she had been singularly incurious about her father it had never occurred to her that it could possibly matter what her father had or had not been i'm sure he was a sinner she mused and mother has never forgiven him sin sin the word that has hypnotized the world my dear what are you talking about mrs brayton turned lightly to her treason granny i don't believe in sin her eyes twinkled back by what standard do you propose to live then out in the world i shall do what i want to do and i won't do what i don't want to do hm sounds very convenient that's quite safe granny if you use your intelligence as well as your emotions the old lady laughed suddenly i should call it a very dangerous doctrine my dear well that's all uncle david believes indeed are you quite sure yes but he is so nice that he never wants to do anything nasty i see they sat still again oh dear began asia going back to the old theme i do wish mother would let me go away in peace well my child she cannot help making this a personal matter it's quite right for other people's daughters to want to go away but when it's your own it hurts there are times unfortunately when your intelligence and your emotions conflict you may manage to escape that disagreeable situation oh i don't expect you always interrupted asia half laughing but i hope i shall always be able to make up my mind to face the inevitable cheerfully and that's what mother can never do have patience child she's learning you young things are so intolerant intolerant yes almost as bad as we are they smiled together and asia drew nearer to the old lady realizing that the evening was going and that presently the good-byes she hated to think of would have to be said they talked jerkily at intervals putting off any reference to the end they were both conscious of the uncertainty of life and that they might never meet again as soon as the silence between them became strained asia turned you'll go and see mother soon won't you certainly my dear asia stood up feeling a lump growing swiftly in her throat taking up the tongs she poked viciously at the fire oh dear i'm going to miss everybody horribly and the place and everything yes said the old lady gently 
I know you won't forget us. Asia turned and looked down at her. I can't tell you what you've been to me, she said nervously. You have made me, you and Uncle David. Mrs. Brayton's eyes were very bright. My dear, you know that in that hoary controversy I hold with heredity. David and I may have hurried you up a little. I see we have, but the final result will be almost as if we had never been. Oh, rot, returned the wise child, stretching out her hands. She drew the old lady up to her, and for some seconds she struggled for expression. Then she bent quickly with streaming eyes. Goodbye, she choked, kissing the lined forehead. I will write. And moving away abruptly, she fled out by the French window and along the garden path. Mrs. Brayton stood still, a few unmanageable cheers straggling down her cheeks. Then, afraid that her son might come in any minute and see them, she sat down and wiped them vigorously away. She readjusted her spectacles upon her nose and took up her book. But she saw no words upon the blurred pages. Her thoughts had not followed Asia. They zigzagged from a skeleton in her own cupboard to the picture of Alice sitting alone waiting for a feared tomorrow. End of chapter 17「Eighteen of the Story of a New Zealand River by Jane Mander. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter eighteen. The next day, having purposely postponed her packing, Asia was busy till the last moment. Betty and Mabel went about the house all the morning with hushed voices and scared eyes. As this was the first domestic crisis into which they had entered, it assumed the terrifying proportions of a world breakdown. Bunty played outside, and the baby Elsie, after being once severely slapped by Alice, returned to break her childish heart among the runner beans in the corner of the garden. But there were no signs of emotional upheaval about Alice. There were dark rings of sleeplessness about her eyes, but she went about as usual, shirking none of the little things she did when she was well. And with her there moved an atmosphere that froze everybody who came near her. Asia was to leave at one o'clock. She did not attempt to sit down to lunch. Instead, she choked over slices of bread and butter as she finished her packing. Alice and the children sat down to a sad meal, where the two girls sobbed at intervals and held each other's hands under the table, and where Bunty was the only one who ate. After lunch, two men came to carry Asia's trunk down to the sailing boat where David Bruce stood waiting for her. At last, with a flushed face, Asia came out of her room. Alice immediately left the kitchen, and walked to the front of the house. Asia kissed Bunty and Elsie, telling them that if they were very good, she would send them something nice. Betty and Mabel sobbed openly upon her shoulder as she begged them to be kind and helpful. Take the children out and down to the boat, she whispered, as she turned out into the hall. Alice stood by the door of her room. Goodbye, mother. Asia looked straight at her, holding out her hand. But Alice could not meet her eye and ignored the hand. Goodbye she answered coldly. They leaned towards each other, and with averted eyes their cheeks slid past each other. Each felt the other stiffen, hesitate, and harden again, and then Asia was gone out of the door, through the gate, and down the path. Alice stood looking after her. She saw the children join her. She saw the blacksmith come out of the smithy, and Bob Hargraves out of the store. She saw men come from the tramway in the booms, and form a little circle about Asia, as she stood on the beach. She saw them all shake her by the hand, and all the hats go off as someone pushed the stern of the boat away. As Bruce hauled up the mainsail, Asia sat down by the rudder. Then she turned homewards, and seeing the figure in the doorway, scrambled to her feet and waved. For the life of her, Alice could not wave back. She tried to, but her frozen limbs refused to move. Her throat burned, her eyes burned. She dimly saw the group on the beach wave, with an energy that seemed purposeful to hide her own immobility. She saw the figure in the stern of the boat sit down. As the sail, catching the wind, shot out of the little channel by the end of the spit into the river, Alice moved mechanically into her room and to her western window. She saw the boat head downstream, but she could not believe it would go on. She said to herself it must turn back. When it reached the first point, she thought she saw it swing. Her hands clutched the side of the window, and her breath raced. But no, it went on. At the headland, she gasped again. It was turning now, but no, it went on. It reached the gap and her heart stopped. She saw it turn in the channel, but no, it was only tacking. It went on. It disappeared. 
even then she waited looking for it after eternal moments she grew dazed the full truth had burst upon her at last and had stricken her soul asia had gone not merely removed by distance but gone out of her life and understanding gone till she herself should bring her back she who did not know how to bring her back with an inarticulate cry she fell on her bed and lay like a stone david bruce did not look at asia till they were well out into the channel then he sat down in the stern beside her his right hand on the mainsail rope and his left along the back of the seat behind her as she steered he said nothing knowing she was beyond speech once or twice she looked back to see the children still waving from the cliffs but not the figure at the window presently he saw that tears were dripping off her cheeks she might have waved she choked giving way suddenly he merely closed his hand upon her arm at the gap asia looked back for the last time seeing no one but only the grey house with its black spots of windows and the group of buildings clustered below and the long streamers of smoke flying with the wind from the mill chimneys as everything was suddenly cut off by the cliffs at a turn in the river asia felt as if her old life was as suddenly cut off from the new it was as if a wall had descended between them and with the elasticity of youth her thoughts leapt to the future and she told herself it was silly to suffer any more but as she turned her face for the first time full upon david bruce she remembered that she still had to say good-bye to him she had barely begun to mention it when he stopped her oh for god's sake child have no tragic last moments with me i'm not going to retire to weep and pray nor do i expect to die before you come back for heaven's sake let's dilute the awful occasion with a little cheerfulness i have to go back to your mother and asia actually laughed and saw that the sun was shining on the golden kofi on the bank and that the river was a shimmering thing of blue and silver beauty that's better said bruce your young life is not blighted nor the world wrecked and everything will go on just the same and everybody will realize it in a week your mother will readjust herself and will soon be reveling in your letters she doesn't know it now but she will i know all this has been so unnecessary so stupid as there was nothing to be said he said nothing you will let me know at once if she is ever ill seriously i mean won't you certainly silence fell between them while bruce watched for gusts from the gullies and asia listened to the swish of the spray against the boat she had always passionately loved sailing and she could not be unhappy long with the wind whistling past her ears and the spray tickling her cheeks it was not till they came in sight of the point curtis wharf and the waiting steamer that she remembered what was happening to her there were things she had meant to say to david bruce things she had often imagined herself saying but they were destined to remain unsaid bruce kept her busy for the last half-mile taking notes of things he wanted her to do for him in auckland and by the time the boat touched the landing steps the steamer was all ready to go was in fact only waiting for her two men ran forward for her trunk and bag and before she realized it she was at the gangway with bruce and someone was yelling all aboard why they're ready she said vacantly yes he smiled putting her arms round his neck she looked fervently into his eyes revealing something of what she had meant to put into words but he ignored it take care of yourself little girl and don't forget to come back was all he said as he kissed her blinded by tears and fighting for control she hurried with her head lowered across the gangway seeing no one at the gunwale she stood looking back at him as the ropes were cast off and the steamer began to draw away she knew that in the world to which she was going she would not look upon his like again but she was wise enough to know even as she stood there that she would get over her adolescent emotion for him and keep unspoiled the hero worship as bruce looked after her he hoped he would be there to greet her when she came back he waved his hat and was glad to see her smile in return he stood till he could no longer distinguish her face upon the deck and when he turned he found himself alone upon the wharf fighting the shock of emptiness that the people left behind always have he dismounted the slimy steps to the boat hauled the sails and started homewards with a heavy heart he knew that to him also the bay would never be quite the same again and he understood why humanity all down the ages had feared and resented and hated change end of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of the story of a new zealand river by jane mander this librivox recording is in the public domain 
Chapter 19 Before Bruce reached the bay, Alice had left for Mrs. Brayton's. She did not go straight there, but stayed for over an hour in the dell, sitting on a little point above the mangroves. A tui sang in the gully behind her. Shags occasionally flapped by on their way upstream. Sparrows and fantails flew about her inquisitively, but she was dead to the sunlight and the call of the spring. She shed no tears. She scarcely moved. When she finally reached the pines, Mrs. Brayton was working on a bed for annuals. The old lady knew it was no occasion for flippancy, and even if it had been, she could not have risen to it. For once, she was at a loss as to how to proceed. But Alice greeted her coolly, begged her to go on with her raking, and suggested that she should help her. The loveliness of the spring day in that sheltered and seductive garden had an instant effect upon her. So, avoiding carefully any reference to Asia's departure, they hoed and raked together, talking as they worked of plants, the last curate, the delay of the English mail, and of the topic that was then absorbing the attention of all English people in New Zealand, the declining health of Queen Victoria. But even as they talked, Alice felt that Mrs. Brayton must think her a fool, or worse. She knew the old lady could hardly avoid taking sides. She had been rather bitter during the last three days about the part she and Bruce had played in helping and perhaps encouraging Asia to go. The thought that her two best friends had helped to bring about the thing she had dreaded for years was not an easy one to dismiss, and only her urgent need of those friends helped her to forgive them. The thought that she herself was hopelessly in the wrong did not make it any easier for her to look either of them in the face. Less ashamed to meet Mrs. Brayton, she had come first to her, feeling blindly that until she was at peace with both of them she would be utterly alone in the world. She hoped the old lady would not order tea. There was something about the sociability of that meal that made it impossible to bolter up reserves, and Alice hated to think that the moment would be fixed when she might have to begin the inevitable references to Asia's departure. Fortunately, the new curate appeared, and he was welcomed with a warmth not always bestowed upon the usually well-timed visits of country curates at meal hours. He stayed to dinner, with no smallest notion of the situation into which he had precipitated himself. However, his ignorance was infinitely more helpful than his knowledge could have been. He thought Mrs. Brayton charming, and Mrs. Rowland an attractive-looking but frigid and dull woman. As a non-member of his church, she was more or less removed from the social sphere he desired, even at Kaiwaka. He had not been in New Zealand long enough to realize that in that radical country church membership did not constitute an entree to exclusiveness, and that in the remote districts of the northern bushes it was not regarded as important. By the end of dinner even Mrs. Brayton's powers of endurance were approaching their limit. Ordering a fire in her own room, for the night had turned chilly, and leaving Harold to digest the curate as best he might, she drew Alice by the arm out of the library and along the hall. I must be going, began Alice weakly, realizing that once they were alone again, she would have to unbend. You are not going, said Mrs. Brayton, with determination, resolved now to manage the business herself. They entered the old-fashioned room, with the firelight playing about the four-poster, on the much-patterned wallpaper, and on the deep chintz-covered chairs. Alice felt like a child led out for a parental scolding, and like a child she sat down stonily, frozen again and unable to help with the beginning. Taking one of her hands, Mrs. Brayton sat down beside her on the low lounge. She began rather nervously, but as Alice gave no sign of hostility, she continued with more assurance, till her voice deepened and broke, as she went on with the personal confession. My dear, I know how you are feeling, and you can't help some of it, but you know we have no right to make the young unhappy. Asia has committed no crime save the crime of being able to get on without you. I know that, that hurts. It hurt me once. But we parents are all wrong. We think these children of ours are our property, that they must come when we say come and go when we say go. We think we have a right to discourage them, to hamper them, to fill them with innumerable fears, just because they are young, and we think they don't know life. My dear, they know more about life than we have any idea of, and they hate our interference. They hate it. And if we persist in interfering, they will hate us. They may not show it. They may tolerate us afterwards. They may keep up a brave show of affection. They may remember our birthdays and keep us out of drafts, and encourage our secret affection for sugar candy. But the great thing will be gone forever. 
they will cease to speak to us of vital things and they will talk to us only about flowers and the weather my dear the old lady paused her head lowered her hands closing nervously on alice's i had one daughter i idolized her never for years did i let her out of my sight i swayed her so i thought body and soul and i believed we were the greatest friends on earth i did not think she could do a thing that would displease me and i thought that was the right thing between mother and daughter then a man came a man i did not think rich enough or good enough i talked of my rights and my will and my affection and my sacrifice and my views as if i had a monopoly over these things she listened she was very courteous she never answered me back and then she ran away with him they had one year of happiness except that she grieved because i never saw or wrote to them and when the baby was born and she lay dying they sent for me it was more than i deserved i went all she had time to say was oh mother and then she lay back dead i have seen her as she lay there every hour of my life since she stopped for alice had burst into a devastating passion of tears for nearly an hour mrs brayton soothed her saying little and knowing that the tears were a relief neither then nor ever afterwards did alice make any reference to the story she had just heard but it altered her whole attitude of mind towards mrs brayton and drew her to her as nothing else could have done and killed her pride and her foolish aloofness i do not know what is the matter with me she choked struggling for composure feeling makes me blind it does something to me i don't know what i have been cruel to her and it is all my fault and to-day i couldn't wave to her i couldn't i wanted to but i couldn't what mrs brayton sat up you didn't say good-bye to her oh yes in a way at the house but at the boat she waved and i could not and i wish i had her tears flowed afresh then you can send a telegram and say so mrs brayton realized the pathos of this little incident i'll write it out and the curate can take it to the post office to-night so that it will go first thing in the morning will you do that yes sobbed alice the old lady filled in a telegraph form and wrote i am sorry i did not wave mother there she said showing it yes please send it when she returned from giving it to the curate she found alice had recovered some composure she sat down beside her again and patted her hands you will get along my dear she said gently we all do we all get along somehow and it is very foolish of us to think we cannot oh i know i am not going to die but oh how i will miss her and there is another child coming her voice ended harshly it was some seconds before mrs brayton could trust herself to speak i'm sorry to hear that she said gravely she didn't know mrs brayton felt this was a case where something ought to be done though what she could not have put into words then her thoughts turned to helping alice to face it she might not have gone if she had known but sooner or later my dear she had to go now you can get on without her make up your mind to it the matter with you is that you don't adjust your mind beforehand to possible readjustments in your life everything is always a shock to you oh i don't know how to help it oh yes you do you know everything changes realize that it will you knew perfectly well your child would grow up and go away from you but you refused to face it you said she will not go instead of saying she will you did not want her to go and you tried to think she would live by your wants i know why she means so much to you but you don't own her she is only yours if you understand her you must love her less and understand her more my dear do you know a line of oscar wilde's for each man kills the thing he loves you don't well take it home with you and think about it it's one of the most telling lines in the language alice leaned back repeating the words to herself it hurt the old lady to see the lines on her face and the pallor of her cheeks and the twitching about her eyes cheer up my dear there's plenty to live for even yet i will try said alice feebly with the faint-hearted resolution of a person attempting what she knows to be an impossible task but before they went to bed mrs brayton had succeeded in comforting her beyond her hopes as she walked home in the fresh morning air and looked down upon the sun-flecked river dancing its way to the sea the natural vitality in alice reasserted itself and she realized once more that she could begin again and that she would not make the same tragic blunder in the future she had not been home ten minutes before bruce appeared to know if there was anything 
he could do when he had gone she told herself that she was in danger of taking what life had left her too much for granted at midday he brought her a telegram it isn't bad news he said at once i've had one as alice read it the tears sprang to her eyes it was very short and said simply cheer up i am still your child she told him of the telegram she had sent i'm glad you did for it was a pity you did not wave it hurt oh david her lips trembled he put his arm round her saying no more asia wrote every week in the third letter was the news that she was off on a six months tour of new zealand as pianist to a concert company at the fabulous salary of six pounds a week to alice this meant going on the stage it took her some weeks with the assistance of bruce and mrs brayton to adjust her mind to that but they managed to keep her from writing even cautiously what she thought of the experiment at the end of the first month she was amazed to receive a present of four pounds from asia and possibly the regular receipt of that amount every month helped her to modify her views of concert companies at the end of six months asia was prevented from accepting a second engagement by a telegram from Roos. your mother very ill baby a week ago born dead she forbade us tell you serious relapse your return work wonders later in the day he received her reply he broke gently to alice the news that she was on the way home she immediately showed signs of improvement and four days later she was well enough to be propped up in bed to watch for the first sign of the sailing boat beyond the gap it was cold and wintry and the river was a dull and angry gray cut to intermittent foam by an irritable wind but it seemed to alice the friendliest river she had ever seen she was not strong enough to sit up all the time so betty stood by the window to watch too i do hope the steamer isn't late said alice dropping down after half a dozen disappointments now mother don't pleaded betty you must not get excited her eye caught something beyond the gap oh is that it cried alice mother don't jump up like that i'm not sure but it looks like the boat she picked up a small field glass yes i think it is the boat yes i'm sure it is now lie still mother for a while could she see if we waved asked alice eagerly no mother not yet i must see said alice perversely she lay with her head to the foot of the bed they had turned her round so that she could look out betty raised her till she could see the gray sail on the dull water then she sank back again her long plaits of hair falling on her shoulders her face flushed her eyes brilliant you must wave she said imperatively something she can see i'm sure she could see a sheet hang it from the window oh all right mother but i'm sure she can't see it yet do as i tell you said alice with sudden fierceness what's this said mrs king coming in you must keep calm dearie mother wants a sheet waved from the window and there is such a wind said betty i don't mind the wind it won't hurt me all right dearie mrs king sensed the situation but you must lie down and be covered up very well replied alice meekly mrs king and betty opened the window and held out a sheet that flapped furiously this is silly protested betty i'm sure she can't see and the children can wave from the cliffs that would be better now now soothed mrs king look what's that isn't that something waving from the boat that's not the sail don't you move sternly to the bed is it really begged alice from her mound of blankets yes she sees she's waving now you just keep calm feeble tears of happiness ran down alice's cheeks tell me where they are she said they announced the progress of the boat bit by bit as it came scudding on with the sails full reefed and the foam flying away in two wings behind it it was just such a day as asia loved best to sail upon the river when it reached the mill three low whistles rang out across the water that's for her cried betty excitedly a salute uncle david said the engineer was going to alice flushed again with pride way from the window now she commanded they're in the channel mother went on betty i can see her she's standing up and looking this way and she has on a dark dress and a white thing round her neck i wonder if it's fur oh my she's waving oh mother i must go mabel and bunty and elsie are off down the hill go on then said alice Shh, quietly frowned mrs king as she bounded forward you needn't hold the sheet any more said alice hoarsely tell me when she's coming i hope they won't keep her they're just by the spit now mr bruce is pulling down the sails she's moving to the bow now she's jumped out and she's running the children have got to her she isn't stopping bless her they're all after her now she's got to the store she's waving at somebody 
It's Mr. Hargraves and Mr. Roland. She isn't stopping. Now, dearie, be calm. She will be here in a minute, and you must be quiet, or she can't stay with you. I will be quiet, said Alice peacefully. Nothing matters now. They heard the wild shrieks of the children following her, and then running steps and the click of the gate. Mother, called a ringing voice from the front step, and then Mrs. King went out to take the children round to the back. Alice saw nothing but a brilliant face that grew into the room till, leaning down to her own, it filled all space. Mrs. King persuaded the children to go down to Bruce to help to carry up Asia's things. There were two trunks and a traveling bag and a roll of umbrellas and a rug. The girls gazed awed at this magnificence. Three umbrellas, gasped Mabel. Do you suppose she brought anything for us? questioned Betty. The mere idea drove them all wild, but Bruce told them they would have to wait. At the end of an hour, he said, Asia would have to leave her mother, and then it would be their turn. As they followed him up the hill, they all fought about carrying her umbrellas and the rug. When everything had been set down in the back porch, they sat down fascinated upon it, lest by chance any of it should be spirited away. I hope she brought me a railway train, said Bunty. I told her I wanted one. Greedy pig, that was just like you retorted Elsie, who was secretly aggrieved that she had not possessed his forethought. While they waited with burning impatience, Mrs. Bob Hargraves arrived with her babies. She was a fresh and charming young mother, who had won her way rapidly into the home life of the boss's house. Glad of a diversion, Betty and Mabel turned excitedly to her and her children. Soon afterwards they heard a rustle of silks. "'Oh, here's Granny,' said Mabel, and everybody made way for Mrs. Brayton who was dressed almost as she had been when she first walked down the green hill to the house on the cliffs. Of all her ancient gowns, the much-darned green and gold was Asia's favorite. "'Get a chair, Bunty,' commanded Betty. "'I couldn't wait, my dears,' said the old lady, as she sat down. "'I was watching for the boat, and I knew she couldn't stay very long with your mother.' A few minutes later the waiting party was joined by Tom Rowland and David Bruce. "'Oh, Uncle David, isn't it an hour yet?' cried Mabel. Just about, he smiled, as he moved on into the hole. Mrs. King then joined them, and after a few more minutes of waiting, Bruce returned. She's coming, he said. With her swift light step and an exciting little jangle of keys, Asia swung down the hall, pausing for a moment to put her coat and hat, her white fur, and her small handbag into her own room, which, like the rest of the house, had been gaily decked with flowers. Her face was flushed, and there were traces of tears in her eyes as she stepped into the porch. Mrs. Brayton was the first person she saw. A thrill fired everyone, even Roland, to stand up as she bent over and kissed the trembling old lady. Then she turned more lightly to Mrs. Hargraves. "'Did you bring me a railway train?' exploded Bunty. "'Yes, I did,' and Asia joined in the general laughter. That unpacking was a wonderful adventure." Things that had already become necessities to Asia were still luxuries at the bay, so that to Betty and Mabel almost everything that came out of those trunks was like an item from the Arabian Nights. But the best thing about it all was that Asia had forgotten nobody. She seemed to have divined correctly what each person would have chosen for himself. Bunty was soon hugging his railway train, Elsie a fully dressed sleeping doll, while Betty and Mabel gushed over the fine silks for new dresses. With a surprised grunt, Roland accepted a pocketbook, and Bruce and Mrs. Brayton smiled over new books and music. Asia's generosity had not stopped with the family, for there were gifts for Mrs. Hargraves and her children, and for every other child about the bay, and she had remembered all whose pronounced tastes had ever impressed her own groping progress towards finding out what she wanted. For a mystic working on the tramway, she had brought a book on theosophy, and for the carpenter, the latest work on socialism. So it was no wonder that for weeks, the whole bay revolved around her return, her clothes, and her new ideas. With the latter, she had come back stocked with the latest novelties in everything from wallpapers to cremation. Before she had been home a fortnight, everybody knew that she had got the boss to promise that the sitting room should be entirely refurbished according to her own instructions, that the stove should be moved from the kitchen to the scullery, that the kitchen should be transformed into a dining room, and that the house should have a veranda built round three sides. With all this, everybody agreed that greatness had not spoiled her. She walked in by the back doors, as she had always done, and not even the most critical could find a trace of anything that might be called an heir. Alice, growing stronger from the moment she arrived, 
did not worry now about the prospects of more adjustments the thing she cared about were that asia brought in all her meals that asia was the first person to kiss her in the morning and the last to tuck her in at night that asia noticed more quickly than anyone else excepting bruce if the light was in her eyes that asia kept the house quiet and put fresh flowers in her room every day all these things she saw even before she had got over admiring the velvet cloak with fur collar and cuffs that had been the gift chosen for her and it really seemed more important to her that asia should not shake the bed than that she should have a tailored suit and six evening dresses even though the latter did rather take a breath away when by degrees she began to notice changes of manner and suggestions of worldliness she told herself it was nothing to worry about that the main thing was that in the fundamentals her fundamentals the world as far as she could see had not spoiled her child end of chapter nineteen